Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the CMU Portugal session of the CNCA meeting. Um, uh, we have the pleasure to have uh, several representatives uh, of uh, very interesting research projects that are going on in the context of the CMU Portugal uh, program. And uh, to frame the program, we will start by presenting a short video about the CMU Portugal partnership before I present the uh, individual speakers. If technology had an identity, it would have ours. If technology had a place, it would be right next to us. If innovation had a trademark, it would be Carnegie Mellon Portugal. First, let's forget the ocean between us. This is a partnership that brings together the know-how of Carnegie Mellon University, a world-class institution from the US, with the experience of the best academic and industrial institutions in Portugal. Since its foundation in 2006 by Fundação para a Ciência e Tecnologia, CMU Portugal mission has been to join forces and place Portugal at the forefront of education, research and innovation in information and communication technologies. So far, the task has had nothing but success. Why? Because we are focused on exploring new research frontiers in areas such as computer science, electrical and computer engineering, public policy, human-computer interaction, software engineering, robotics and language technologies. Our overarching mission is to foster industry science relationships as agents of change, focusing on education and research for social and economic impact. Here's how we've been achieving it. Through dual-degree PhD diplomas between Portuguese universities and CMU and supporting mobility programs to give Portuguese researchers and students the opportunity to visit CMU and establish the ground for new research collaborations. Research is a keystone of our partnership, and we are strongly committed to supporting groundbreaking projects in ICT, fostering interdisciplinary collaboration between industry and academia. Throughout the years, we have financially supported already over 72 collaborative projects. Recently, the most ambitious call under the program of the CMU Portugal. For the first time, 10 research projects are led by Portuguese companies, representing a strong public and private financial commitment to foster the cooperation between researchers from Portugal and CMU with national companies, promoting innovation and technology development for a global market. CMU Portugal has also been a hub for entrepreneurial initiatives, with 12 startups launched or facilitated by our activities. Together, they contributed to over $200 million of international investment, which allowed the creation of more than 1,000 qualified jobs. Most of all, we are proud of having built a strong research community that contributed effectively to an impressive number of publications, registered patents and successful PhDs and master's theses. But the best is yet to come with new research projects and initiatives, connecting companies and academia on both sides of the Atlantic. This collaboration will keep on contributing to thrive in the innovation ecosystem. One thing is guaranteed. We will keep doing everything in our reach to bring technology into people's lives for an even brighter future. Um, thank you. So, um, I forgot I forgot to introduce myself. My name is uh, Rodrigo Miragaia Rodrigues. I am uh, the co-director of the uh, CMU Portugal program in Portugal. Uh, the other co-director is um, my colleague Nunu Nunes, who joins us online. And on the CMU side, we, uh, uh, the, um, the other director is uh, Professor uh, João, uh, José Fonseca de Moura. Um, I'm going to give you a short 
uh, uh, presentation about the CMU Portugal program. Uh, the program has been uh, in place for uh, well over a decade. Uh, it has um, uh, um, proceeded in a series of stages. We are now entering, entering the uh, third stage. The first uh, two stages were, um, um, next slide please, yeah. The first two stages were um, in uh, approximately five years each. And in this uh, third stage, our goal is to create an innovation ecosystem with uh, high-tech companies and uh, world-class uh, research to uh, develop knowledge in the area of ICT, and in particular, by uh, um, uh, developing the data economy and trying to help uh, these highly innovative companies extract value uh, from their data. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the program has essentially two uh, main pillars. Um, one of them is talent development. In that respect, uh, the, uh, we are offering several, uh, next slide please. We're offering several um, types of programs. Uh, we have dual degree PhD programs where students uh, spend about half of their um, um, doctorate studies at CMU and the other half in a Portuguese university and they have co-advisors uh, co in both uh, locations. Um, we're also developing two uh, advanced training programs for professionals, one in data science and the other in uh, user experience. This is something that we uh, hope can, uh, can be ready within uh, the next few months. Um, we also have mobility programs that allow students from Portugal to spend a period at um, Carnegie Mellon and also for faculty and researchers to spend their, uh, uh, an, uh, a period in Carnegie Mellon, for instance, in their sabbatical year. Uh, right now, uh, we have an ongoing call for uh, our dual degree PhD program, so uh, any student uh, can, in, in the areas of ICT can apply, and um, this, um, in this program, they, the students, after they complete their PhD, they are awarded degrees both from a Portuguese university and also from uh, a counterpart uh, department at Carnegie Mellon, and we have uh, agreements ongoing with um, a variety of different degrees at Carnegie Mellon and different departments at Carnegie Mellon, ranging from uh, computer science, electrical engineering, um, engineering and public policy, and other uh, areas. Next. The other main pillar of the program is knowledge creation, and here we uh, have funded a series of research projects throughout the years. Um, and in this long list, you'll notice that we have not only a variety of different uh, uh, types of projects, some of them are more applied, others are more blue sky, and also in, with a variety of um, 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 durations and uh, different types of research being conducted. Um, the focus of this particular sec session uh, is on a set of large-scale collaborative research projects that have started um, this year. And um, in this call, we have funded 12 projects with, with a total investment of 24 million euro, uh, of which uh, 4.3 correspond to private investment and 6 million cor correspond to the uh, CMU investment. And um, of these 12 large-scale uh, collaborative research projects, um, we have a series of companies that are involved with the universities, with the researchers, both at Portuguese universities and at Carnegie Mellon. And as you can see by the list of uh, industry promoters and co-promoters, we have a series of highly innovative companies, companies that really uh, invest in knowledge and in research and to develop cutting-edge products and to be on the forefront of uh, of their areas. These projects are in collaboration, like I mentioned, with uh, Portuguese universities and with Carnegie Mellon, and we, have, we are also pleased to have a, a variety of departments involved in these collaborations. We have a total of eight Carnegie Mellon departments in, uh, involved in these projects, and uh, with uh, 17 uh, different research institutions in Portugal also involved uh, in, in uh, various different lo locations of the country um, 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 
corresponding to those, to those institutions. Next. Today we'll be hearing about three different projects uh, in the area of healthcare. We believe that this is a strategically important area because it is an area that has a very important interface between information and communication technologies and their own uh, um, research. And uh, we will be hearing, and I will present you later, uh, three uh, different projects, uh, uh, the three key people, key people the involved with these projects, the projects are called Intelli Intelligent Care, Tami, and WOW. And uh, next slide, and that's it for now. So uh, next, what I will do is I will ask if Nunu Nunish is online, if he wants to say a few words before I present the speakers. Thank you, Rodrigo. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I cannot be there due to uh, problems with, uh, with getting back to Lisbon. Uh, I just like to uh, congratulate everybody for the, all of the effort, all of the students, all of the researchers and the projects uh, and the companies involved and hope for a great session that I'll be uh, trying to attend uh, if my plane doesn't uh, start. Thank you very much again. And apologies for not being there. Okay, thank you, Nuno. So um, I will then move to introduce the speakers. Uh, let me start by thanking all of the speakers. Um, two of them are here with us uh, today, and the other two are online. And I'll introduce them one by one before they uh, they do a short presentation of their own uh, involvement with the program and projects they are leading. Uh, so I will start by introducing. Uh, my colleague from CMU, Carmel Majidi. Uh, Carmel is the Clarence H. Adamson Professor of Mechanical Engineering, and he has a uh, long history of collaboration with the Carnegie Mellon Portugal Project, and I uh, think he's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, how much he has benefited from uh, that uh, collaboration. So thank you again, Carmel, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to present to you, and. Uh, I've benefited immensely uh, from this program, so I'm uh, uh, very eager to share uh, the work uh, that I've done in collaboration uh, with my colleagues at uh, the University of uh, Coimbra um, in uh, ISR on work that we've been doing on soft and stretchable electronics uh, for applications uh, in wearable health monitoring and medicine. Um, and uh, for the WOW project uh, uh, that you'll see uh, uh, towards the end of this, uh, uh, the meeting. Um, a lot of the uh, work that uh, we plan to do in collaboration uh, with the rest of the WOW team will build on some of this uh, work. So soft electronics uh, for uh, wearable computing um, is a very hot area of research. Uh, there's uh, been uh, really tremendous progress uh, over the past uh, uh, 10 or so years on developing uh, uh, sticker-like electronics uh, that can uh, adhere uh, to the body and be used for all sorts of different sensing modalities. Uh, and these uh, sticker architectures have a variety of different uh, material compositions uh, and designs. Um, in terms of uh, emerging applications going beyond uh, healthcare and, and physiological monitoring, uh, these architectures uh, also have application in haptics. And in particular, uh, they have the potential to make haptics thinner, uh, lighter, softer, and more compatible with the human body. So also a very exciting uh, direction of research. Uh, and also, uh, increasingly, there's been interest in using these soft electronics uh, for energy harvesting, uh, in particular, uh, placing uh, various types of uh, energy harvesting transducers or generators on different parts of the body uh, and using that to generate electricity uh, from body heat, motion, and, and friction. And this is another area uh, that my group has, has uh, been involved with and also represents uh, another uh, exciting thrust in this field of wearable electronics. Now, in all these uh, cases, uh, there is a important uh, design challenge, uh, which is how do we get soft materials that are compatible with the human body uh, and engineer them in ways uh, that they can exhibit functionalities that we typically associate with much more rigid electronic materials. So we wanna get sensing, electrical cir circuitry, um, computing elements for signal processing. Uh, and we want to package this in a way uh, that the sticker uh, or that wearable device has the same elasticity uh, and the same compliance as our natural biological tissue. And so this represents a really important challenge 
in engineering. I, I call this soft matter engineering because it involves incorporation of soft materials. Closely tied to this is the challenge of soft materials integration. Uh, with most of these implementations that, that we've been exploring in our collaborative efforts uh, uh, with our colleagues in Portugal, uh, we've been using a combination of soft materials uh, and also rigid microelectronic components. So uh, the soft materials function as a carrier medium. Uh, it also functions as highly stretchable and soft electronic circuit wiring to create interconnects between these embedded chips. And the chips are necessary for various sensing modalities uh, along with signal processing, um, power regulation, and also wireless communication. Ultimately, though, the overall package system should be thin, it should be lightweight, and it should be soft and elastic so it can be compatible with the human body uh, and remain functional without resisting natural motion. Early um, in my research, uh, before uh, our collaboration uh, through CME Portugal really took off, uh, a lot of our early work uh, was on serpentine electronics. And this really uh, built on research from other groups um, at Princeton and, and University of Illinois and Northwestern uh, on creating stretchable electronics using conventional uh, electronic materials like copper and gold, but patterning them in ways uh, that they uh, have this stretchable functionality. So you can see in the top left and to some extent in the top right images, the copper wiring used to connect all of these surface mounted electronic components uh, have this serpentine type shape and that allows these uh, circuits to uh, uh, bend and also stretch to some extent. Here's a video of a more recent implementation uh, that shows um, how these uh, circuits are incorporated into these wireless stickers. I'll let the video play out here, but you can see the layup uh, where we have a fabric, uh, we have the skin adhesive at the top, and we use laser micro machining uh, to cut the copper circuitry, these traces, um, to form these electrical inter interconnects between these surface mounted components. So for us, this had represented the state of the art of what we could achieve uh, with uh, soft and uh, wireless electronics that you could adhere to the body and use for physiological monitoring. However, in a minute, I'll talk about some of the fundamental limitations uh, of this approach. As a prototyping method, uh, and as for making these kind of one-off implementations, um, it's a good enough solution. Um, as you can see here, we can, uh, within a few hours, uh, use rapid prototyping to create this uh, um, body-mounted sensor for monitoring knee motion. The serpentine shape of the wiring uh, allows for fairly really robust uh, functionality. Uh, we can stretch these uh, to about 50, 60% strain uh, before the digital electronics uh, fail uh, due to uh, mechanical rupture. Here's just a few examples of various types of sensing modalities that we can achieve uh, with these uh, serpentine electronic circuits. Now, I mentioned that these do have limitations. Uh, one limitation uh, is uh, that Manufacturing of these can be fairly intensive, and in a lot of cases, if uh, we want to scale this down, uh, we do kind of micro scale uh, circuit architectures uh, will require a clean room fabrication. Uh, and another uh, issue, as you can see on the bottom right, um, is that we get delamination between those rigid copper interconnects and the surrounding soft rubber substrate. So, a uh, way to uh, overcome those fundamental challenges uh, with internal mechanical failure and delamination of those serpentine uh, circuits uh, is to replace the copper with conductive elastomers. Uh, and typically, uh, these elastomers are composed of a, uh, either silver uh, or a carbon uh, filler uh, that's uh, embedded uh, within a soft uh, rubber matrix. And this allows for electrical percolation and electrical conductivity. And this is what we started with in our collaboration uh, with uh, ISR uh, at University of Coimbra. Um, so working with Anibal uh, Almeida and, and uh, Mahmoud Havakoli, this is Mahmoud's uh, lab on the left here. Uh, and this has been an incredibly fruitful uh, collaboration. So I wanna spend the next few slides talking about the progress that we've made developing soft electronics uh, in, in this uh, collaborative effort. Now, we started by using the more conventional uh, technique of 
carbon filled elastomer composites. So, so these are uh, soft silicone rubbers that have a very high concentration of, of carbon powder. Uh, the carbon itself is electrically conductive. So by having a very high concentration, we can form electrically conductive pathways within the rubber. And this has been very effective uh, for creating all sorts of uh, resistive and capacitive pressure and strain sensors that we've been able to incorporate uh, into a robotic uh, hand prosthetic that Mahmoud's lab has developed. And this has led to uh, several publications uh, that, um, we, uh, uh, that, that we prepared in the early stages of our collaboration. Since though, uh, we've largely shifted to liquid metal uh, as a soft conductive material. Um, as you can see here in this video, if we put a microfluidic trace of liquid metal uh, within um, a strip of soft silicone rubber, uh, we can get highly stretchable circuit wiring. Uh, and this overcomes a lot of the challenges with the serpentine the copper traces, or for that matter, these particle filled elastomers. We have very high uh, metallic conductivity, uh, but because the conductor is fluidic, uh, it can deform almost infinitely as the surrounding rubber is stretched. And so I'll just very briefly show some of the work more recently that we've been doing with Mahmoud's uh, lab uh, in incorporating these liquid metal uh, electronics into soft uh, bioelectronic stickers. Um, the, the, First uh, effort uh, with uh, liquid metal uh, involved the creation of these biphasic uh, circuits. And, and this was a discovery made in um, uh, Mahmoud's group. Uh, they were uh, experimenting with printing silver ink uh, using a, uh, just a standard uh, desktop inkjet printer. Uh, and then they would coat it with this liquid metal. And the purpose of the liquid metal uh, was to dramatically enhance the electrical conductivity of the traces. Uh, but also make these much more mechanically robust. And so when we transferred it to the body or when we subjected uh, the circuitry to bending or stretching, the liquid metal uh, would help keep all those silver particles uh, connected um, because of its uh, ability to deform and, and, and uh, uh, stretch and flow with the, the um, surrounding rubber. Uh, here's an example of a, a study. Um, uh, that Mahmoud's group uh, had led where we assisted on exploring uh, soft bioelectronic uh, applications with liquid metal. Uh, so as you see on the left, uh, we compare our printed um, liquid metal circuits uh, with a variety of other um, uh, soft uh, conductive technologies as well as uh, gold standard uh, technologies that are used in uh, commercial uh, bioelectronics. Uh, and what we found uh, is that uh, the liquid metal architectures tended to outperform even those gold standards. And so this has been very promising and, and this is what has inspired us to adopt these technologies for this uh, uh, WOW project. Um, here's an uh, example of a fully integrated uh, soft electronic sticker uh, that's capable of electromyography, so uh, EMG um, uh, monitoring of, of muscle activity. Uh, and here, uh, because of the high performance uh, of our soft electrodes and also because of the mechanical robustness of those liquid metal interconnects, uh, we can have uh, very good conformity with the skin and, and very accurate reading of muscle activity. So in terms of future challenges uh, that, we, um, that we and others uh, uh, need to address uh, for further progress in this field of soft bioelectronics, um, one of the challenges uh, is still um, due to mechanical failures. Uh, in the case of liquid metal interconnects, uh, the failure doesn't occur at the uh, interface between the conductor uh, and the rubber, as you have seen before with the serpentine circuitry. Instead, in these cases, uh, the failure uh, tends to occur at the interface of the embedded microelectronic chip uh, in the surrounding uh, silicon. So that's, that's something that, that we're currently facing, and there's a few uh, solutions to that. Uh, another uh, area, um, as I mentioned, uh, is in the field of uh, energy harvesting and also energy storage. Um, uh, all the batteries that we use currently uh, are these uh, rigid uh, lithium polymer batteries or these um, coin cell batteries. Uh, and what we need uh, moving forward are soft, flexible, and, and even stretchable batteries. So the bottom video shows a stretchable battery that we've recently created in my group uh, that can uh, remain functional um, even when stretched beyond 300% strain. Uh, Energy harvesting represents uh, another important challenge. So the video in the top uh, shows some uh, recent work uh, where we've uh, developed a triboelectric uh, generator using liquid metal rubber architectures that we can incorporate uh, into a pad that we place uh, on the kneecaps uh, of a jogger. Uh, and as the jogger runs, that repeated contact between the skin 
uh, and our liquid metal um, uh, generator uh, creates triboelectric charging uh, in the change in capacitance uh, associated with that between the charge and the, and the counter electrode uh, results in the generation of electricity. And uh, as we get towards the end of this video, you see that after uh, several minutes of, of running, uh, we can uh, charge up a battery and use that um, to then uh, power a wearable computing device. And so in a, uh, a few seconds here, you'll um, uh, see that um, now that the battery is fully charged, uh, we can activate this device. You can see that the um, digital display turns on uh, and we can also operate the uh, embedded microprocessor uh, and also onboard sensors for temperature and humidity uh, monitoring. The top right uh, shows all, uh, some other kind of recent early effort uh, from my lab on um, thermoelectric energy harvesting using these liquid metal uh, components. Um, another uh, a direction or outcome of this collaborative work uh, has been spin-off companies. Uh, so, um, so we know that you know for the CMU Portugal project, entrepreneurship represents a very important aspect uh, of these uh, uh, funded uh, efforts. Uh, and so, we've had not one but two uh, spin-off companies uh, derived uh, from this project. So, Soft Bionics, uh, uh, led out of uh, Mahmoud's lab, uh, so based in Portugal, uh, and then based out of Pittsburgh is Life World Labs, which I co-founded. Uh, with a postdoc who was supported uh, on the CME Portugal uh, project and also had the opportunity to go out to, to Portugal to particip participate in that collaboration. So in terms of next steps and future work for the WOW project, we want to build on these liquid metal architectures. Uh, uh, we actually want to move away uh, from um, onboard uh, uh, batteries and, and power sources and, and shift uh, towards uh, wireless RF technologies, not just for wireless communication, but also for wireless transfer. And so both Matt Mood's group and, and my group have had some good preliminary success achieving that with these soft uh, liquid metal uh, stickers. Um, and then another uh, important challenge is microelectronics interfacing. Um, and so we've made a lot of great progress um, uh, through this collaboration. Uh, and most recently uh, on the right is an image from Matt Mood's group uh, showing a more recent implementation uh, where we have even more robust electrical interconnects and, and, and contact uh, interfaces with, with microelectronic components. Uh, and then lastly, something that both of our groups are, are pursuing uh, is studies on biocompatibility and cytotoxicity. Um, this is not so much a factor for on-skin uh, applications. The liquid metal is fully encapsulated uh, within uh, the rubber. Uh, but if we ever do want to use these materials in implants uh, or for direct contact with internal tissue and organs, then we do have to better understand uh, the biocompatibility of these materials. So I'd like to th uh, close uh, by thanking of both uh, uh, research groups, so, so my lab at CMU, the Soft Machines Lab, and also Matt Mood's uh, Soft and Printed uh, Microelectronics, and then more generally uh, our, our collaborators at, at ISR and in Coimbra, and then uh, the sponsors uh, for, for this work. So thank you. Thank you, Carmel. That was uh, fascinating. Um, I understand that you have to uh, leave for a prior commitment, so you cannot stay for the debate, right? <laughs> That's correct, unfortunately, I, I, I will have to. Uh, but, but thank you so much for, for giving me this opportunity to present uh, work on our collaboration. Oh, thank you, thank you for a, for a great talk. Um, so I'll move on, but, but uh, by the way, nonetheless, we will still hear more about the, the WOW project because uh, Margarita is here and she will be able, able to tell us a little bit more about the, the project. Um, so thank you again, Carmel. Um, and let me introduce the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Francisca Leite. Francisca has a uh, doctoral degree from MIT, so she's uh, moving, switching camps from uh, MIT to CMU uh, in this role. And uh, she is uh, here as uh, representing the uh, um, uh, Intelligent Care Project. Uh, Francisca is uh, uh, with the, the uh, uh, Hospital de Luz Learning Health uh, who, who, which is a, uh, a partner of this uh, project, please. Thank you very much for the invitation. Very, very uh, happy to be here to uh, tell you about our project. Uh, so it's a project financed in the CMU uh, Portugal program. 
And I think nowadays everybody really thinks about this uh, healthcare uh, world and what is the future and all the challenges that we are now encountering. And uh, we know what these are at this point. We know that we don't have enough hospitals, we don't have enough people, we don't have enough equipment for, for what we need at these days. Of course, these are not normal times and uh, these will pass, but still, this is not something from today. So we know, and we have been seeing this for quite some time now, that uh, the healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP is, is growing in many, many countries. And it's actually been increasing to the double in the last 30 years in many countries. And this is mostly because of aging. Population is getting older, is getting more chronic disease, and chronic diseases are responsible for a lot of, of this increase. But at this point, what we see is that this probably won't be, won't be sustainable much longer. So we really need innovation in healthcare. We really need, and we are doing this, uh, fortunately, worldwide, from universities to hospitals, we're really getting new treatments, new diagnostic, diagnostic procedures. So there's a lot of innovation going on. The problem is that innovation is also expensive, and it's not enough. It's not enough to have a new drug, or it's not enough to have a new MR machine if people then over-abuse uh, healthcare, or if lifestyles don't, don't change in a way that we also are able to reduce demand on the system. And also, once people get to hospitals, it's absolutely crucial that the hospitals work extremely well. Unfortunately, again, this is very difficult because healthcare is very complex. We have disease complexity. Diseases are complex. We have more and more diseases. We, are, we have diseases of the old uh, that we didn't even know existed before. We have diagnostic complexity. We have more and more ways to diagnose. That's great. But on the other hand, which one to use in a given disease in a given circumstance is also something that has to be planned and has to be done in a, in a specific way so that we really get the best diagnos diagnostic possible and that we don't overspend. We have treatment complexity. Uh, again, we have to follow very rigorous guidelines to make sure that we're doing the best for the, the patient that we have, and again, that we don't overspend in doing things that are really not needed at the time. We have workflow complexity. We have a care that is m more and more multidisciplinary, involving very large teams, and it, there's, there's, if there's not no communication, if teams don't work in, in, a, in the best way possible, then there's medical error, and there are people dying from that, and it's something that is a, a really great problem. It's the third cause of death in developed countries because uh, there's, there's just too much complexity going on. And so with all of this complexity, uh, innovating, changing, of course, is also different difficult. Uh, we hope, and there's a lot of people talking about AI and in many sectors, and also in healthcare, there's this hope that AI will really change and help in, across all of the, the areas of, of healthcare. There's even those that believe that AI will replace what the doctors do in many, many di different areas. And in the end, we'll, the doctors and the nurses will have time for what is actually the most important thing, which is spending time with the, with the patients, explaining the treatments, and really uh, empathizing with the patients. Of course, this is still kind of far in the, in the future, but that's the hope. And also, healthcare will help, uh, sorry, uh, artificial intelligence helps in another way, which is basically putting us more in control, we, the patients, in control of our health. We have more and more apps that we can put in our phones and that will help us diagnose and, or, or even monitor diseases and, 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 and that will also bring us a lot of data, that structured data that we don't really have available in the hospitals in a, in a useful uh, way sometimes. So there's a lot that AI can do for the field. It, we're not there yet, but there's a lot of hope that will really help to really bring healthcare to the future and to, to be more sustainable. And that's where our company uh, comes up. So Learning Health is a startup inside Lucia Wood's uh, group. It, it, it was born from the, the, the desire of becoming more than an early adopter of technology. And so we were born to with the mission to shape the healthcare workforce of the future. So in the middle of all of this complexity, in the middle of what we know is a, is a business model that really is not sustainable and needs to 
change? What can we do? How can we train people to understand this, to act on this, and to really innovate? And we do this putting together these three uh, pieces, training, research, and innovation, supported by a simulation center, one of the most simulation centers in Europe. Uh, we, don't, we are not alone, of course. We are in an ecosystem of innovation with other companies, with universities, and also with startups. Because with this big, such a big challenge like healthcare, uh, we need to really have a network approach. It's not enough to think that only hospitals will deal with this or only the large corporates, the large pharmaceuticals, or only the governments. This is something that we all need to participate from the patients to the startups to, the, to these corporates to the universities. So this is where we are uh, dwelling. And in terms of research, we have all of uh, many different interests, but mostly concentrated in three areas. AI, of course. Human factors engineering, which is very important, and I will explain later why, and also clinical research. Always to bring value for patients, because of course that's the most important thing. So what about our project? Intelligent care. Uh, what we aim here is to build a multimorbidity decision support tool to help doctors and patients and hospitals will deal with this uh, condition. So what is multimorbidity? Multimorbidity is typically defined as having more than two, two or more chronic conditions simultaneously, which is something with aging has been, uh, we have been seeing this growing quite a lot. So prevalence is, has been increasing exponentially. And nowadays, uh, people older than 65 years old, we see that at least 35% of them have, have at least two chronic diseases at the same time. And again, this complexifies care in many, many different ways. This is a very ugly graph from a very a beautiful uh, paper that basically shows that as you add more conditions, of course, treatment complexity increases. And particularly when we're dealing in, in a, in, uh, with systems, healthcare systems, where more and more people are being treated by specialists and not so much by the, the family doctors and the, the GPs, what we see is that we have a seal of the approach to this. And so what many times ap happens is that di different specialists will give different medications to the same symptoms sometimes without, and, and these will, of course, again, have some not so good uh, uh, outcomes. And again, there's also other problems that we really didn't know, and now with data we're starting to realize. Again, a very ugly graph from a very beautiful paper, basically showing that symptoms that are often, uh, they are, there are signals of heart failure, like for instance, um, F uh, fatigue or shortness of breath or pain, and typically so a cardiologist will treat a patient for shortness of breath and for fatigue, thinking it's due to the heart failure. But the thing that we see is that most times these are actually related to comorbidities like diabetes or COPD or renal failure. And if you don't, if this, this patient does not go to the pneumologist or the, the renal specialist, won't be treated for these in the right way, and will keep showing these symptoms, and at some point we might be taking too much medicine. So what do we aim to do in intelligent care? What we want to see, what we want to do first is to be able to detect multimorbidity very early on, so that we can start treating these people for the conditions they have in the right way. Uh, in a personalized way as well, because we know that there's many different types of clusters of multimorbidity. People can show heart failure with diabetes, and but in this, but this can also vary depending on the lifestyle this person has, or it can show also heart failure and COPD. And so there's different uh, profiles, and there's and also in putting together these with other other variables that we can measure, we can adapt the way we treat these people so that they will go less to the hospital, so that we can, at the right time, anticipate if there's something that is going to, to happen, prevent uh, an urgent visit in the middle of the night that, uh, in, in the end, will have the patient stay in the, in the hospital, which is something that we all want to avoid. As I said, we're going to do this using data that we already collect in the hospitals, but also uh, in a second stage, 
getting all of these additional data from patients, from sensors, from questionnaires that people can also uh, fill in at home, and then we get this data about the quality of life, the physical activity, sleep patterns, life events, and all of these data we know and we hope to show that will really change the way these people are treated. So we're doing this using data, as I said, from the hospital and also home care. We're looking at structured but also unstructured data. We're trying to identify these clinical phenotypes and then build this, what we call these clinical pathways, basically, for a given cluster of multimorbidity patients, what is the, the care that we need to do, what are all the steps that we need to uh, uh, go through to make sure that the patient has the best care and the less complications. Uh, to do this, we have a very strong, uh, very strong partners from Technico, Inesc, ISR, Priberan that will really uh, help us in all of these uh, uh, projects to, to get this thing done. We all, in, uh, in addition to, to Learning Health, uh, we also have the participation of Hospital de Luz, and this really will only be, po be possible with a multidisciplinary team. So what, in fact, are we doing here? So again, just going through this a little bit more in detail, what we want is to identify these patients with multimorbidity. We want to know how to characterize these patients. We want to be able to build the evidence and build these clinical pathways that will allow us to treat the different patients in the way that is the best for them, and also to understand and show how these additional variables will be able to improve uh, multimorbidity uh, management. This is all great, and I, I'm absolutely sure that we'll get a lot of things from data, and, if, and we'll be able to really understand a lot more about multimorbidity, but then there's this second part of the project that is equally important, and it's where typically what we see until this point, unfortunately, with AI is that it may work very well in the lab, but then when we go to the, to the hospital, it fails. And it fails because hospitals are complex places, because hospitals have processes, because sometimes or oftentimes we don't really think about what's happening already and understand and plan to how we can integrate these new tools in, in the, this complex work that I, I showed you earlier on happens in the hospital. So it's extremely important to plan this in advance, to, to study what happens, to understand how it will have to change so that people will in fact profit from, from these AI tools. And also, there's a lot of other power dynamics going on in the hospitals. There are, there are doctors and there's nurses, and there's power dynamics there. And these things happen, and we need to know how to address them so that amazing tools that sometimes and oftentimes we have really are used and are not just put somewhere and not thought of anymore. And so this is something that we're also dealing with in this project, is really already studying what is happening nowadays, how is the, the, the care of these patients coordinated inside of the hospital, how we identify these patients, how this clinical decision tool can really be helpful, and who is going to use it, and how it should be constructed in a way that people will, in fact, use it at the right time. And so again, this involves a multidisciplinary team. We need to have doctors, we need to have nurses, we need to have operational and management managers of the hospital involved, and they need to be very much involved. It's not just showing them something in the end. They need to be involved from the beginning, together with the human factors team that studies the user experience so that we are able to, in the end, get a tool that really is going to, use, to be used and that really will bring value to patients. Uh, again, just a knowledge, CMU, Portugal program support. Very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. The, the project sounds uh, fascinating. Um, so my next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Luis Rosado. Luis is a senior scientist at uh, Fraunhofer Portugal, uh, and he is a partner in the uh, TAMI project. TAMI stands for Transparent Artificial Medical Intelligence. And so Luis, please tell us more about this project. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to, to share our project in, in this uh, great uh, 
event. Let me just share the, the screen with you. Okay. I think you are now seeing, okay. So um, the TAMI project, uh, first of all, uh, a disclaimer, um, I'm hearing the representation of the lead promoter for solutions, uh, which unfortunately could not be, be present, but I will try to share with you uh, their vision and their expectations for, for this project. Uh, TAMI stands for Transparent Artificial Medical Intelligence, and this is also a project uh, approved by the um, call uh, in, in, in co-promotion in, in co international partnerships. And um, just a brief uh, uh, outline of the presentation. I will start with the motivation of the of the project. What is the problem, and uh, the opportunities that emerge by tackling this this problem. Also, uh, what are the objectives of the, of the project? Uh, what we are going to uh, we are proposing as a solution uh, for the, for this problem, and also briefly present to the team and the, and the timeline for the project. And then in the end, also address what are the expected results, not only from the R&D perspective, but also uh, what commercial opportunities we envision uh, uh, with the outcomes of this project. So to, let me start with the brief uh, uh, contextualization. Uh, as you all are aware, uh, um, the current rise of artificial intelligence has brought to exciting advances in a wide range of of applications. Medicine is one of them. Uh, and this was greatly boosted by three main factors. Uh, the fact that uh, there is right now uh, a large and diverse uh, data sets available. Uh, there we also have access to improved algorithms and uh, we have also new levels of computing power. But uh, despite this, this spectacular success of, uh, of, of AI recently, uh, there are still huge challenges and uh, the previous uh, presentation also highlighted that. And uh, in particular, there are areas of public concern that we consider that uh, are constraining uh, a wider use of, the, of these AI systems. And uh, one particular example for, for these concerns and these needs is the European Commission report that was released last year, where, uh, which is related with a comprehensive European industrial policy on artificial intelligence. And in this report, it's clearly stated that uh, AI needs to be ethical by, by design. So characteristics such as uh, transparency and explainability should be embedded in the development of, of these uh, AI systems. Uh, so in other words, um, the problem that we are currently facing and focusing on the, for instance, in the imaging uh, domain. Uh, so we are uh, right now, some models are, are achieving very good results. Some of them even surpass, surpasses the, the humans in, in specific tasks, but many of them are like black boxes. So um, we don't know the internal logic and inner workings uh, uh, of these models. They are hidden to the user. So this is a serious disadvantage because uh, prevent us as humans to verify, to interpret and to understand how particular decisions are made by this uh, AI system. This was also one of the um, main motivational factors for the emergence of, new, uh, of a new field of study, uh, which is uh, called explainable artificial intelligence. This is one of the main building blocks of this, of this project. And uh, what this new field of study tries is to, um, to make a shift towards a more transparent and interpretable uh, AI development. So if we focus on, uh, on specifically on the usage on, on AI in medicine, um, this, uh, there are a lot of challenges. And uh, one of them is the fact that uh, decisions in medicine are very complex and usually uses uh, diverse, uh, diverse data. So uh, we can have different types of data to take a, new, a new, unique relevant uh, decision from images, time series, text. And um, in order to, to give this, uh, this diverse data in a stand, standardized way to the, to the machine learning algorithms, we need to tackle problems in terms of um, 
mapping where is this data, uh, how, how, how are we going to fuse this data, how are we going to integrate this data in order to standardize the inputs of, of these models. Uh, but besides that, uh, um, and if we look to the, um, to, to the clinical domains that you use images, we can clearly see that right now there's an in, inherent tension between performance and explainability. So right now, uh, the best performing models in a wide range of use cases are, are based on an approach called deep learning. And um, right now, this is one uh, 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 approach in, in AI that is the least transparent because it's not uh, uh, clearly understandable for the for the user how a particular decision was made. And in the opposite, the, the, the approach, more conventional machine learning approach that uh, are more uh, clear and, um, and transparent, right now are not uh, achieving the, the performance of these uh, um, deep learning approaches. So uh, we know that uh, in medicine, uh, eye performance is a, is a must, so it's, it's almost mandatory. But uh, at the same time, uh, we also need to enhance trust and, uh, and give the basis to, to certification of these, uh, of these uh, approaches by knowing how the, the inner workings and their reasoning behind the decision. So we need to balance between uh, uh, this high performance and but also uh, transparency and explainability. So one of the main challenges in this project is to uh, try to achieve these two uh, um, uh, requirements at the same time. So we want to develop uh, approaches that uh, uh, are high performing in, in, in the medical domain, but at the same time, these outputs can also be understood and cross-examined by, by the users. Or in the other words, what we aim to achieve is not only give uh, develop algorithms in specific uh, uh, in specific areas that don't only give the decision, but also give an explanation, uh, a reasoning for, for, this, for this particular uh, decision. So one of the objectives of, the, of this project is in fact, um, develop this uh, next generation of AI models that uh, have embedded these requirements in terms of interpretability and explainability. And uh, it's very clear for us that uh, um, there's there's not one one solution fits all. So we we cannot achieve a structure of uh, an explanation for a specific uh, decision that fits all the use cases. This must be dynamic and must be adaptable to specific use cases. Um, first, because some most of the times we are talking about uh, uh, multimodal problems, so we have sources of data uh, from from different types, images. Um, text, uh, time series, uh, and second, because we have different users with different profiles. So for instance, if you have a user that only works uh, um, in the image domain, let's say a, a microscopist, probably explanations in the image domain will be the, um, the way to go. Uh, for instance, with uh, uh, approaches like uh, highlighting in the image, which areas contributed most for this decision, what are the characteristics on on the on this particular image that most contributed to the to, the, to this decision? But at the same time, if you have use cases where also the electronic health records are used, we need to adapt to to this uh, health character and also show how uh, the 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 multimodal uh, decision was made. So what are the the, um, the key aspects in the electronic health records, for instance, family history coupled with the uh, result of a specific exam and the presence of specific structures in the, in the, in the image that uh, contributed to this automatic decision of the AI system. Second, uh, what we realized while, while uh, exploring this, this idea is there are not uh, standard and clear ways to, to, to evaluate the interpretability of AI models. So uh, what we aim also aim to achieve is a quantitative method that we can objective, objectively use to assess and compare different types of explanations. So we have a, a library of different types of explanations that we can deliver to a specific decision we need to, to understand 
which is the type of explanation that best suits a specific uh, profile of, of the of the end user. Um, and this, uh, what we try to do is bridging the gap between these raw uh, measurement measurements in terms of interpretability with also user-centric measures. And here we con we count with the con contribution also with our human center design team, which is going to have an active involvement with the with the uh, uh, health characters to to shape this um, evaluation metrics. And third, we also believe that um, doing these methods is not enough if you want something that uh, can 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 be effectively used in the clinical practice. Uh, um, uh, and so, so the way we show these decisions and these explanations uh, uh, need to be adapted to the clinical practice. So uh, this, this, uh, these outcomes cannot uh, uh, be an overhead to, to the already very exhaustive work that the health characters do. So on the other side, this, this, uh, this tool needs to be uh, as intuitive and as transparent as, as possible, so it can uh, uh, can be really easily embedded in the in the clinical practice. So having these um, uh, different approaches, uh, I, I will say more uh, ground uh, ground basic research about these generic methods. We in this project also aim to apply them in specific uh, uh, clinical domains. And we are talking about four different immunological domains, which are the um, cervical cytology, cervical colposcopy, glaucoma, and chest uh, X-ray. And we this uh, build a platform that uh, uh, deliver this um, this functionality. So here um, I have a diagram that um, represents the, the architecture of, of of our solution. So basically, we have these horizontal layers where uh, we have these generic uh, methods that we aim to, to develop. The first one more related with the, the, the decision. So it's the, the, the layer where we develop the models that actually uh, give decisions that aim to support the, the, the clinical practice. Uh, and we will receive as input image data and also electronic health records. On the second layer, we have this translational layer, which also tries to generate the explanations for these particular decisions of the, of the layer below. And then a third layer, which is uh, used to evaluate which are the best type of explanation for a specific profile uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the clinical practice. And uh, a fourth layer, the top layer, which is the interface layer, where we are going to develop the support tools and demonstrators. And here we have these four uh, clinical domains I, I, I referred previously that, uh, as you can see, goes transversely uh, being fed by, by the different uh, layers uh, developed so we can uh, um, uh, demonstrate uh, uh, the, the usage of this generic approach in different uh, use cases. And of course, these are going to be changed both for clinical inputs, uh, but also from, from market inputs. So in terms of the team, the, the, the lead promoter is for solutions, Sistema de Informação. First is currently the main supplier of screening management software for, for National Health Care Service in Portugal. So they have uh, actually uh, in usage uh, different information systems that are supporting screening programs such as the cervical cancer and the diabetic retinopathy um, um, programs, screening programs. Uh, as co-promoters, uh, we have uh, Front of Portugal, uh, which is a team led by, by me, in Ashtec, a team led by Professor Jaime Cardoso and Professor Aurelio Campillo. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University, of course, uh, led by, by Professor Azim Smeguji, and also um, Administração Regional de Saúde do Norte, which is going to be very important in the, in the, in the clinical domain, and also to, to make the bridge with our clinical partners. So we also have clinical partners, some of them are, are subcontracted. Um, and this is a key aspect because we need this commitment from the clinical partners to, 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 
successfully execute this, this project. Uh, and they will work, uh, help us in the clinical guidance, also in the data collection and annotation, and then in the end, in the, in the field trials and evolution of, of the solutions. So I will not go into detail about the, the timeline, so just uh, to let you know, it's a three-year project started in, in, in April. In blue, we have here a lot of uh, R&D um, tasks that are going to tackle the, these um, problems I uh, I've been talking, but uh, it's also worth mentioning that we have a, a very important work package related with the field trials. So we really want to to go to the field and try these approaches and see if it actually brings a benefit uh, for, the, for the clinical practice. In terms of the expected results, um, from the R&D perspective, uh, it's uh, directly related with these approaches that we want to, to develop related with uh, generating explanations for, for to support the decisions, uh, multimodal explanations and be uh, very customizable and adaptable to, to a specific use case and a profile within this use case that is going to, to use it. Uh, a, a very quick example in the cervical uh, cytology, we have the cytotechnicians that work just in the microscope. So here we can focus on uh, um, in uh, explanations only on the on image domain, but then we have the, the medical specialists that also use the electronic health records. And then we can have more complex explanations and more complex models that also use these uh, uh, text information to, to take the decision. Then uh, we want to develop these methods to assess and, and select the, the most suitable explanation for, for each specific uh, use cases and, and profile, and then have these novel visualization uh, methods to present the decisions and the, and the explanations we, without overheads for the, for the clinical practice, but uh, uh, actually uh, turning the, 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 the process more, more efficient. So then we want to merge all these contributions in, uh, in computer-aided diagnosis tools in these uh, different uh, um, use cases. Here on the right, we have some illustrative images from uh, cervical cytology, cervical colposcopy, um, glaucoma analysis, and also uh, chest x-rays. Um, just a quick uh, note about uh, this, um, this uh, ver vertent of the chest x-rays. Right now, we are focusing uh, on the, um, using X-ray images from, uh, um, from uh, positive or suspected COVID-19 suspects the, because there were really some public data sets uh, on, on this aspect. And so the, the team from Inestet is actually working on these uh, data sets to see if we can uh, develop automated tools to, to predict and understand the, the infection. To finalize, in terms of commercial outcomes, um, first solution already has these uh, information systems that are used on the screening programs. So we aim to integrate these computer-aided diagnostic tools in, the, in this information system and also uh, provide the, not the decision, not only the decision, but also the, the, the explanations and also take this opportunity to evolve the system and bringing new capabilities in terms of annotation and visualization. Um, besides the, the information systems for the screening programs, uh, we also envision a more broad uh, uh, platform being used for scientific, academic, and uh, commercial purpose, where also we are going to give access to these uh, computer diagnosis tools for healthcare workers outside the, skin, the screening program, and also uh, use this platform to, to, use, to, to provide uh, filter and anonymize data sets for researchers that can be used to, to increase the knowledge base for, for academic purpose. And um, basically that, that, that's it the, I have to, to present. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. This uh, also sounds like a very interesting and uh, impactful project. And our last speaker is uh, Margarita Neri uh, from Glint, and um, she's representing the uh, WOW project, which has a very uh, long acronym, but is related to um, 
devising uh, smart beds for uh, hospital patients. And so, uh, please, the floor is yours. Well, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Well, today I'm going to be talking about wireless patient biomonitoring and smart IoT system connected to patient's bed at the hospital or at home. Well, this seems a lot of things and it's very extensive, but in, in few words, what I'm going to talk about is about uh, wireless uh, biomonitoring of patients. Uh, well, let's see if I can... Do this okay? Yeah. So first of all, I'm just going to uh, present myself. I work uh, at Glint, and um, Glint's um, business um, is mainly the, in the health um, area, and we work with uh, with uh, health providers and with pharmacies. We're pr our two biggest markets are Portugal and Spain, and our um, we are a technology uh, company and we work focused on the citizen's journey, uh, focusing on health management uh, besides the, the disease management, but uh, our main focus um, is on health management. That's why we are now a part of this consortium that's working in WOW. Um, and along with Glint, we have ISR from Coimbra, and they are uh, an important part in this project because they are printing the stretchable and electronic skin um, devices and their expertise is helping us uh, with the IoT and the AI um, mod modules. Uh, for University of Coimbra, um, we're having the um, material science expertise and the hospitals of Coimbra well, they are also uh, widely known, and they are one of the biggest healthcare centers in Portugal. And they come to the project with a pilot and with the patients that we're going to monitor. For Carnegie Mellon University, well, Carmel has already spoken, and we have his contribution with the uh, biosensors. So, for this wireless biomonitoring patients, well, we work on the patient's journey and we want to improve the quality of life for everyone in the, in the society. And when we are using this uh, wireless biomonitoring, what we want is for the patients to have the best comfort there is. So make sure that they are unfettered uh, from all the wires that you have on a hospital bed. And make sure that they are autonomous, they can get up, they can uh, go uh, from one side to the other, they just can give a small walk uh, around the bed, and also um, to power for the domiciliary hospitalization. So we don't want uh, patients that don't have to be in the hospital, um, in, the, in the hospital beds, we want them to have the best care possible, and the best care can also, and most of the times, uh, is at home, where they are better, they are with their families, and if we can promote this kind of, um, of approach, well, it's, it's better for everyone. It's also, um, it also implies some cost reduction, because we are uh, not having all the hospital beds occupied, so if we're removing the patients from the hospitals, we'll have more um, ways to uh, treat other, other patients. And also for the biostickers, the way they are being um, assembled uh, is uh, using materials that can also be um, more, um, more cheap and, uh, than the ones that we are now used in, in hospitals. For all stakeholders, well, we have data and data is power, so if we can get, we have this data, then we can have everyone informed and we can have better policies. So I'm just going to share the project components. So for the biomonitoring stickers, they've already been mentioned by Carmel, and he knows a lot, <laughs> a lot more than I do on this area. Uh, but mainly, we're going to have uh, biomonitors, biomonitoring um, uh, stickers. 
that are going to measure the vital signs like heart rate, heart rate, temperature, um, ECG. We're going to see some motion and to detect some, some motion from, from the patients. And then in a highly um, new approach and experimental approach, we're also going to, to try to find some of the emotions from the, uh, of the patients uh, using the galvanic skin response for emotional computing. Well, the information that's being collected from the stickers is going to be collected in a smart box. That's going to be, I don't, I don't have a pointer, but if you see for each patient, he's going to have the sensors, and then you have the smart box um, in, each, in each bed. So each patient has one bed with a smart box. That smart box is going to collect the information, and then all the information goes to a smart gateway. And in this smart gateway, we're going to have an interface between the um, smart bed IoT and the hospital solution. In this case, we're going to, it's global care that's going to be showing the information to the doctors. Um, also, um, an experimental and a breakthrough that we want to have with this project, like Carmel said before, it's the harvesting and the storing of um, the energy. Because one of, the, um, one of the problems you can have is that all these wireless uh, biomonitoring stickers um, have batteries and we want to make them live longer and for that uh, we need to, to power them <laughs> and we're going to try to, to find the smart box solution that can give this, also can help with this, with this challenge. So for the patient evaluation, we're going to have uh, global care, we're going to collect all the information, and then for doctors and nurses can see uh, how, the, how the patient is doing, uh, if he's at home or if he's um, in the hospital. So next, I'm going to show a video for all of you that have assisted to Carmel's presentation. You just can check your emails now because for the next two minutes, I'm going to show you why we call this WOW. I must confess, I never get tired of watching this, this video. Uh, well, it, when it comes to our project, uh, for the WOW project, the biomonitoring stickers, I'm um, showing some samples of what has already been done uh, by the um, Institute of Systems and Robotics in Coimbra. 
and the um, biostickers that we're going to have in this project will be similar to, to these ones to collect the vital signs and the other signs that I've just um, that I've just mentioned earlier. So for now, and what we've done since April till now in this project, we've already selected the pilot for the project. It's going to be in the University of Coimbra, our partner, and it's going to be the orthogeriatric service that's going to uh, work with us in this project. We are now defining the user requirements um, just to make sure that when we go to the pilot stage at the end of the project and we're going to have the biomonitoring stickers in the patients and everything assembled, we are going to um, get information that's useful for the clinic, um, for, for clinical evaluation, so for doctors and for nurses to, to work with. Um, one thing that I, I didn't mention is that we're going to have a pilot with uh, five people. We are going to work with them um, in the hospitals, um, in, the, in the hospital service, so in the hospital stay, but we also want to bring them out um, and to the, um, to the home of the, of the patients and to make sure that they are still going to be monitored. So along with, um, with defining the user requirements, we are also doing the um, definition of the system's architecture because we need to have the smart beds working, um, working well. So we are also working on this interface. So from the, um, from the bio stickers to the smart box, to the gateway, and then to global care to present the information. The designing of the biostickers and selecting of the sensors is also uh, a work that we, are, that we are doing now. So for the expected impact, and like Carmel said, said before, we're going to demonstrate with this project for the first time ever, the integration of biomonitoring the skin um, into a professional health information system. So we really want that the data that we're going to collect uh, is going to be used and it's, it's, it's safe to be used, it's credible to be used by um, doctors, by nurses, and that they can do medical calls based on, on this information. Uh, we are also... so. When we, when we come to the um, positioning and commercialization channels, well, the first ones will be hospitals, but we also want to take them to home care and to pharmacies that are near population. And so it, it also makes sense. And we can't skip talking about a pandemic situation like the one we're living now. Um, I'm sure that for these biomonitoring stickers that we're talking about, they won't be uh, useful for COVID because the vaccine will come sooner than, than the project will end. But for a situation like the one that we're having nowadays, and that we don't want a lot of people in the hospitals, we want to make sure that people are safe and that they are being correctly monitored outside the, um, outside the hospital. Well, these kind of situations will help us to monitor people that don't need to come to the hospital, that they are okay at home, uh, they are safer at home, but still have a quality um, in, their, um, in their health and in the, in the health care that's being provided. So I want to thank you, everyone. If you want to know more about us, you can check our, our website. And happy to be here. Time for a very short discussion, about um, five minutes only. So um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm probably only going to be able to ask, ask one round of questions. And um, I would like to ask you um, the following. Um, as academics, one of the main concerns we have is if we are providing the right training to our students and to our doctoral students in particular, so that they can subsequently move to very good jobs, a few of them in academia, but more and more of them in industry. And in fact, uh, my students, uh, the students from my group nowadays get more jobs in industry than in academia. Uh, I guess my question is, um, do, these, do you see these projects as contributing for creating the conditions to have those sorts of 
uh, positions for PhD students to move on to companies and do highly innovative work? And uh, more generally, what is the role of uh, PhD graduates in the innovation that you are doing in your companies? And how do you see that role evolving? Uh, maybe you can start, Francis. Well, I, I can tell you that our project, for instance, would not uh, happen if there were not two PhD uh, people in uh, our company. So that's the main reason why we were able to get this project going, so that's extremely important. Uh, we do have a, a, a different way to think than most people in companies, and that's very valuable, and the way we can structure information is really helpful. It's not all, only particular to PhDs, of course not, but it definitely helps. And specifically when we go to these kind of projects which are complex and you really need to understand to be able to have a, a consortium that works, we need to be able to understand what the people in the universities and in the academic institutions are saying. If you, and if you don't really have the training, it gets very hard to do that. We have been, uh, that's one of the things and one of the difficulties in this project at this point is that it's really the hiring because we were looking for a PhD people to help us in this. And we finally were able to, to hire a person at this point, but it was extremely difficult. There's not a lot of them, and not a lot of good ones. And the first few interviews that we were only able to interview people that were just ending the undergraduate, so not really a lot of PhDs that were, we were able to hire, also because the market is global at this point. But it definitely helps, and I really cannot see these projects going on in industry without having PhDs there. That's absolutely impossible to do. What happens then is that they become very university driven and not so much company driven. And, and I really think, at least in healthcare, it doesn't really work. So I definitely think we need to have more PhDs working in the companies. So, am I? Oh, it's, it's on, okay. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with, with, uh, with what has been said. And for our companies, we know that if we want to have a breakthrough, if we want to do something uh, out of the box, well, yes, we need to work with, uh, with investigation with the universities for this project. We have PhDs not only for, the, um, for ISR and for, for all the, the other um, parts of the consortium, but, but it's important because if you want to do the wow things and the, the breakthroughs, you need to have uh, the, um, the curiosity and um, from, PH, um, from PhD students and from PhDs. Um, and also, you have to have a balance and then for the companies to know what's good for the, for the market and, and what has to what has to wait for some time to go to the market. So I think it's a, it's a good symbiosis that we can have here. Now for Luigi, if Luigi is still there, uh, Fraunhofer is uh, an institution that bridges academia and industry. How do you see um, these projects helping in establishing that bridge? Yeah, it's really important uh, because uh, in, our, uh, in our philosophy of research at Front for Portugal, we already have this metric. So we try to do research really close to the companies and really close to the applicability. And uh, we always try to, 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 to have these projects to, to create more competences in, in, in our team. Uh, it, it's, uh, because if you want, I completely agree with the previous suggestions because um, if you want to deploy something in the, in the clinical practice, uh, we need really strong competences, very maturity in terms of our skills. And um, we always try to, to bring to these projects really strong teams and at the same time also include uh, um, persons of the team that can evolve also to a PhD. So doing the PhD during the, the project and we are going to try also to do this in the, in the time project. And so as a last question, I would like to ask you, how do you see the role of Carnegie Mellon uh, in this partnership? What is the value added by having uh, a, a world leading university in this area working with you? I can start now. Well, for us and for uh, WOW, uh, it's the bio stickers. Uh, we know that we couldn't achieve or we won't achieve um, what we want. It's the monitoring at home 
if we don't have the expertise, if we don't have Carnegie Mellon, if we don't have Carmel and all his team uh, working with this, with this breakthrough. So for us, uh, I, I may say that we wouldn't have a project for that. Um, and this project, I really believe, um, uh, and uh, that it's going to be very important and uh, that it has, um, it's going to have in the society the ability to let people stay at home, be cared at home, uh, focus on health, not just on the disease, because we know that if people stay longer times in, in hospitals, the depressions and some other um, not so good uh, diseases can, can come. And for this kind of project and to make sure that we're going to be well succeeded, well, I think that uh, Carnegie Mellon and this bio stickers, this technology is, is very important. Francisca? Yeah, uh, again, um, Carnegie Mellon in our case, as we have people there with the particular expertise to design clinical pathways that really don't exist in Portugal yet. So, of course, in just that sense, it's very useful and important to have them on board. But overall, it's always important to have really uh, smart people put together in discussing this, in this case, in virtu virtual rooms. And so Carnegie Mellon people, of course, super important to have here, also bring up the international perspective, which is quite important because in healthcare, it's, there's a, a lot of variability if you move from countries to countries from different healthcare systems. So that's already all, all, just in itself very important. Of course, it's always also extremely important to have people from Technico and all of the Portuguese institutions that we have on board. Again, putting smart people together, it's always the best way to go in these very complex problems. And Luis, uh, to conclude, uh, your, uh, how do you see the involvement of Carnegie Mellon? Yeah, it's also very, very important uh, uh, because when you are talking about uh, projects, we have such disruptive ideas and concepts like uh, explainable AI, uh, having, having different perspectives from, uh, from different contexts is, is very important and this will require a lot of uh, discussions and brainstorming and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, explore different paths and, and so a very strong team uh, is, is very important and also uh, we know that uh, and Carnegie uh, Mellon the, the type of uh, research they do uh, probably have a more f uh, focus on how to deploy this in the, in the, in the in the, in the clinical practice, so we see in the, in the Carmel presentation when we talk about the, the spin-offs and how to shape what we are already researching to be effectively used in, in, in practice. So I hope that this collaboration with Professor Azim also contributes in that respect. Okay, thank you. So this uh, concludes our session. I would like to once again thank all of our speakers. Uh, I uh, would like also to thank the audience and hope that you uh, enjoyed the session. Thank you. <laughs>